on Channel 6 Television, Grassy Roots with Dr. Jim Carrey and Beth Overhow, a show which will guide you down paths to healthier living by simply adjusting your eating habits. Stay tuned to Channel 6 for Grassy Roots. <music> Hi, and welcome to another episode of Grassy Roots here on Channel 6 Television. I am here again with Dr. Jim Carey, who is leading me down a path of the raw living foods lifestyle. Hello, Jim. Hi, Beth. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing super. Thank yeah. you. Better now that I'm here. <laughs> it's been a long time since we've got in front of the cameras again, at least it seems that yeah, way. Weeks go by real fast, <laughs> and they take a long time. Um, it depends on what we're doing in our lives. You've been staying highly raw? Pretty much. You know, yeah. at, at least a, a breakfast is highly raw. My lunch is medium raw. Mm -hmm. And then at night, it's 70% mm -hmm. raw. I, I've, I have meat about four times a week still. Oh, a fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't do beef anymore. Mm -hmm. No more beef. How do you feel? I feel pretty good. I yeah. feel pretty good. Um, I've been... Uh, more energetic, slept better. My nails, look at that. Oh, your nail. That, my that, nails are you tough. You see the difference already. Major, yeah. major yeah. difference in my nails. They'll grow faster too. Yeah. 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 And I've always had to have acrylic nails, so that's that's significant for me. <laughs> nails. One of those neat side effects or benefits. Uh, yeah. 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 They find out for yourself. I've been thinking this week, though, as I, you know, as I plan for this episode. Um, when I tell people that I'm trying this new eating lifestyle, they they ask about the protein. That's a typical question. Mm -hmm. How do you get enough protein? But um, if you mention that you you feel better, it has a health benefit. Some of them think, you know, like, where's your documentation? Where's the proof? You know, how come we don't hear about this on on major network television, you know, that, that eating raw vegetables is, will make us healthier. Let me ask you a question first. Okay. Um, where do you get your protein? Uh, lately? Mm -hmm. Nuts, I think, have been mm -hmm. the major, and those, um, a lot of those sprouts I've been eating. Uh, nuts and grains, but you know when people are questioning your lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's always neat to answer a question with a question <laughs> and put it back on them. So here's a good one for you. Where do horses and cows get their protein? Well, they must get it from uh, grains, mostly. Yeah. And grasses. Yeah, grains okay. and grasses. And look how big they are. Yeah. So it's not like you're not going to get enough protein in right. the diet. And we could go down along. Well, we've talked about the protein myth on a previous well, show. Well, I know one thing that has reduced. I don't think my protein has. Mm -hmm. I haven't worried about that a bit. I think I've reduced my carbs, you mm -hmm. know. And that's a good thing because carbs made me sleepy. Yeah. If I ate a lunch that had potatoes and bread, by half an hour later I'd be, uh, you know, mm -hmm. really zonked out because the, the highs from the sugar and then the the change. When it, so I don't have that. Great. Yeah. We keep this up, and you'll be doing the show without me. <laughs> <laughs> Scientific evidence, Beth. There's sci I I found documents, books going back to 1860s that talk about the advantage of a plant of a plant-based versus uh, animal protein based diet but when people see a book from 1860 or 1905 or 1940 they say oh you know they don't trust it because it's old okay well I brought with me the scientific answer for today's world this is the China study by Dr. T. Colin Campbell he's an MD and a PhD he spent over 40 years as a government researcher working for the uh, FDA and for the, I believe it was American Cancer Society. Uh, he has over 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers and document in journals like the American, journal, uh, American Medical Journal mm -hmm. and the New England Journal of Medicine. I mean, this is a who's who in research. And he wrote this book, The China Study, 
Because after 40 years of doing this, and by the way, um, he went from meat eater to vegetarian to vegan over the years. He got into a health challenge uh, with his voice, and he went on a raw vegan diet to heal his voice and get his voice back. Because uh, the doctors told me, well, you're just going to have to get one of those voice boxes and learn to talk like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So when he retired, he was very concerned. He was actually upset by the fact that his papers for 40 years have, have proven that people respond best and live best on a plant-based diet. Uh, understand, he went into this with a, re, with a presupposition because he grew up on a dairy farm. He knew we needed meat and dairy. So he had to prove that out of himself in his early years, and mm -hmm. that all happened, it all occurred. Um, what I like about the book is that it's written for laymen, and especially the first hundred pages are simple and straightforward. It's called the China Study because one of the largest studies he worked with was 8,000 people in China for over a decade that they tracked their diet and their health. But he addresses issues here in the, just in the first section, lessons from China, turning off cancer, plant-based diet again, a house of proteins, problems we face, solutions we need, uh, diabetes heading the list, obesity. And throughout all of these, he shows where animal research and um, human research, time and again, has shown that the plant-based diet, he actually explains how a plant-based diet turns cancer off. <laughs> I, I, I left you speechless. <laughs> That's great. It, it, it takes away the food for the cancer, I suppose. Is yeah. That, is that what happens? Yeah. You, and he shows where it. cancer thrives in a uh, low oxygen, acidic environment. And a plant-based diet gives you a high oxygen, alkaline environment in your body and especially in your blood. And cancer can't survive in, survive in that. And that's where they... That's where these so-called spontaneous remissions come from. Uh -huh. um, because the cancer, it, it's better than chemo. Right. And it's there, but it's hard for the medical establishment to make any money doing it that way. Well, you know, you can flip through the channels and get to those channels that do documentaries on obese people mm -hmm. who are going through gastric bypass surgery, uh, you know, the morbidly mm -hmm. ill. But um, there, in America alone, just plain obesity, not morbidly, but a plain mm -hmm. obesity is a pretty serious problem. Yeah. Coupled with the increase in our heart disease, increases in cancer. Well, all these things tie to obesity. The they funny thing is, if you, if you, and they tie to the eating. If you, if you cut your weight, all these other, th all these other health challenges just go away. Mm -hmm. um, Eighty percent of America is overweight. Um, that's, and, and and that leads to the heart disease. Um, the, the cancers, even into the osteoporosis and all the other health challenges that we take more and more pills for, and the answers in our diet. Neat thing about the book I wanted to share, 35 pages of bibliography, and look how small that type size oh, is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a scientific, it's a scientific journal. The second and third parts of the book, you see he gets into all the charts and graphs. I mean, he, he lays out all the science here. But look at this chapter right here. How to eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can do your own research, too, because, because of my interest in all this. I've been going on the Internet and uh, plugging in different subjects. I have an interest in ulcerative colitis, for example, mm -hmm. and I found a, a research-based project on that where their subjects, having done the wheatgrass juice, um, were healed, and those on the placebo were yeah. not. You know, and this was a scientific study, but you don't see that coming out and coming through the ulcerative colitis doctor's clinic, you know. The neat thing <laughs> about scientific studies that include placebo is that for most of our so-called wonder drugs and miracle drugs, people do better on the placebo than they do on the new drug, but they don't publish that part of it. <laughs> Maybe 25% will show an improvement on placebo and 18% on the actual drug. So it's mind over matter sometimes. It was it's placebo, well, actually, you know, you as I've said before, healing is physical, mental, emotional, right. and spiritual. Uh -huh. That's why we talk about things like we don't own our diseases. In other words, I don't have cancer. I'm overcoming cancer, okay? Um, 
little mind twists like that start the healing process right there. I maintain that on almost any diet, people do better for three months because they change what they're putting in their body. But after three months, you get into new imbalances and new challenges because you're still not eating the way the body was designed. Um, I won't name names, but um, how I got involved with Ann Wigmore was a similar process. I had gone from here to there to vegetarian to some other primarily raw-based diets, but a lot of my research was based on typing in problems with problems with blah, blah, blah mm -hmm. diet. And mm -hmm. oh, people don't hesitate to put up websites and blogs about, oh, I, w I did really well on that program for five years and then boom, because they were eating too narrow. Um, they, they weren't eating a balanced, a well enough balanced diet. Um, some of those programs I, I've encountered like that have changed since then. And I respect that when somebody says, oh, we do see some problems here. But when I started typing in problems with Wigmore diet, problems with raw living foods, I didn't find any. What I did find was testimonials from people that said, I went to Wigmore 35 years ago, I'm still cancer free, I'm still asthma free, I'm still whatever. Um, that's actually how I found Dr. Ann's program six years ago. And I know on your websites, mm -hmm. um, rawdoctors.com mm -hmm. and Chi Diet, of course you have the videos uh, for mm -hmm. people to see, but Chi Diet blog, and many other routes that people can go through to do their own research on mm -hmm. this. And sure, they'll probably find some people that call the raw vegans, uh, you know, alternative thinkers or whatever, yeah. but but they're going to find evidence too that it works. I on YouTube last night came across a video. I believe I came across it because of your website though. I was going mm -hmm. through the links, you know, and I found a YouTube video of a young man who was 500 pounds and he almost had the gastric bypass surgery and had not had tried everything. He says it in his video that all yeah. the things he'd tried and now he's a big time proponent of the raw living foods lifestyle. He looks good. And, you know, I think his name was Michael. I remember that's, the video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, that's who you find on the internet too, or the people that it's worked for. I saw an AMA study just a few weeks ago. I mean, that's when I happened to see it. I'm not sure how far back it went. It said 25% of the people that have gastric bypass surgery have complications therefrom. And the other thing that's happened to an acquaintance of mine that did that, she did the bypass surgery with liposuction. Mm -hmm. So she lost over 300 pounds in a week. But because she didn't change her eating patterns, she's gaining the weight back. Right, I've heard that too. And she's getting bigger and bigger again. And there's no, there's no second time around on this. No. That was a one-shot deal. And she went from 600 pounds to, I mean, almost 600 pounds to down under 200, with especially liposuction. Um, and while she hasn't mentioned physical side effects of it, um, by not changing her life pattern, she's just getting large again, and all that money gone. And it's a matter of educating yourself, not only mm -hmm. about what the different foods can do for the different parts of your body and what the vitamins are in the foods that you're eating. It's like you said, the person who thought they were doing good because they ate so much fruit and they became borderline diabetic. Yeah. You got to watch out. What you do is you yeah. have to be informed. And She actually became insulin dependent diabetic. Oh. But she was living almost exclusively on fruits. Fruits. And all that sugar did her in. Yeah. So, yes, it's about, there's no substitute for educating yourself. It sounds so simple to just grab something off the, off the shelf and say, I'm not going to worry about what I eat. But... Ignorance is not bliss in this case. Ignorance is suicide. It's, it's fairly ir irresponsible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's irresponsible. And we think we know what's good for food and good this and that. But they're what we call social mores. Uh -huh. um, social more is something that everybody believes because everybody believes it. Like, we all know the world is flat, okay? <laughs> and we all know that the universe revolves around the earth. Oh, wait a minute. We yeah. don't believe they those two anymore. Yeah. We change those two. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But those are social mores of the time, uh -huh. okay? Um, so, too, is it with, like, what I call the protein myth. Um, Americans consume five times as much protein as they need. That has side effects causing osteoporosis. But people say, where are you going to get the protein you need? You really don't need but a fifth of what you think or what you've been eating. So these social mores do us in 
because we think we know what a balanced meal is, and the ag large agribusiness and large pharmaceutical, they're pushing, hey, if we maintain the status quo, we're going to make lots of money off of you. Um, when you educate yourself to the realities, it's a real eye-opener, mm -hmm. and you're just shocked, like, why doesn't everybody know this? But it just, it's like, Colin, this book was, this book was written, um, I'm trying to remember, it's like, I've had, I've had this copy for four or five years. Um, I'll put a link to it on the website. The copyright date is 2005. So it's four years old. He's Hi. never been on prime, prime time talk shows. Now, he lectures all over the country. Um, he's a fascinating lecturer. And uh, he really, I mean, he all over the country. So if, keep your eye out or Google T. Colin Campbell in the name of your city. I'm sure you'll find something locally. Mm -hmm. But um, these aren't the things that get picked up on primetime TV. It's just not the things that Oprah or any, you know, John Stewart shows an interest in. I don't know if that's, well, you know, we can talk conspiracy theories all we want, <laughs> but the fact is that the, the, the you know, the, the books are out there, the scientific research is out there. Jo Dr. John Kellogg wrote extensively about this when he was running the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Uh -huh. But because that was the 1930s and 1940s, um, we discount that, we ignore it. But um, there's truth in those words, yeah. and things have changed since the 1930s and 40s in the way the Americans eat. Well, you know, sure, we've got the canned food processed, yeah. uh, more meat, more meats available. Mm -hmm. They uh, increased their abilities to grow more grain to feed the cattle and the chicken and all that. Instead of feeding the people with the grain, they're feeding the animals with the grain and want you to buy the animal. Oh. You know, so in there's 19, 100 years ago, right now, um, less than 5% of America's population lived in the cities. And when you live in the city, you have an issue of delivering and distributing food before it goes bad. So 95% of America lived in the country, and they were the producers, and they had that access to country food, so to mm -hmm. speak. Now, less than 5% of our population in America lives in the country. 95% lives in the city. And what's the easiest way to distribute food for people in the city? Process it so that it'll last forever. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a big, long shelf life. And downside of that is um, there's no nutritional value. You feel full, but you're, you're literally you starving to death for the full. <laughs> you're starving to death, or actually not starving to death. It's, they say, you're dying of malnutrition with a full belly. And that's what's happening in America. Yeah. And it's, it's sad. And, and we could, I guess, at another episode, we'll talk about raw parenting because not only are we responsible for our own bodies. But when we have children or family members that mm -hmm. we inf have influence over, uh, our thoughts and actions and attitudes toward food influence their health. And As how you they bend will the be. branch, so grows the tree. Right. Yeah. And uh, so all this is, I, I'm just, my eyes are being opened up throughout all this time. This raw vegan food, living foods, lifestyle, edu education. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. And. You hit the nail on the head. You're feeling better. Oh, yes. And I appreciate doing the research. You know, I really enjoy it. And I would recommend anyone who has not looked at any of Jim's websites or done any of your own research on the raw living foods lifestyle, even if just the vegan lifestyle, I think you would your eyes would be opened to a whole new way to approach your life and to have a healthier and more satisfying existence. And uh, we're going to cook, aren't we? Or not cook. We're going to food prep, right? We're going to uncook out in the kitchen. We're going to do some uncooking next, so stay around, and uh, we'll be right back. Stay tuned for more Grassy Roots after these words from our sponsors. Want to learn more about a raw living foods lifestyle? There's a wide collection of videos on the subject at chidietvideos.com. You can find a video on any subject that suits your interest and your budget, including rare footage of Dr. Ann Wigmore's Raw Living Food Lifestyle Programs. This knowledge could change your life. Check out chidietvideos.com. 
One of the best things terrorists could do is just build more fast food restaurants, maybe add another pharmaceutical company, have a couple more infomercials, and encourage people to eat the way they eat now. And everybody's going to be dead in 100 years. They can just walk right in, don't have to do a thing. One quarter of what you eat keeps you alive, and three quarters of what you eat keeps your doctor alive. I used to get high for a living. Me. Cancer rates going up, heart disease going up, stroke going up. We're poisoning ourselves with highly processed, nutrient depleted foods. One of the major problems is what we do to the soil and the air and the water and everything we take in our food. We, for whatever reason, decided we're going to spray everything with every kind of pesticide, herbicide, larvicide, fungicide. We decided we're going to genetically modify things we don't know anything about. Can we actually improve what has already been created? And the answer is maybe, but not the way we've been doing it. If you want to know what's wrong, look down at the table. It's staring back at you. Think of it as chronic malnutrition, because that's what's going on. But if we think we're going to go to the doctor and get a pill for everything, we've missed the whole point. We have been taught our whole lives to be consumers of modern medicine, which is pharmaceutical medicine. Good health makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make a lot of dollars. Now, the drug industry has every right to make money, no question about that at all. The ethics, I think, need to be very closely watched. What the pharmaceutical companies are doing may not necessarily be in the interest of our population. You can be as sincere, and you can be sincerely wrong. Approximately 106,000 Americans die from pharmaceutical drugs each year. And these are people who took the medication as directed. There is a lot more turning to alternatives because what's being done before him doesn't work. There is no magic bullet, but there is a lifestyle change that reverses serious chronic disease. It's cheap, it's simple, it's safe, it's effective. The solutions are here. They've always been here. Every single person in the world, every culture, every language, every person in the world knows it. You are what you eat. Food does matter. It's a choice. You don't have to be sick. For a full-length DVD copy of Food Matters, go to grassyroots.com slash food. You're not going to cook anymore? How will I live? I didn't say that I wasn't going to cook for you anymore. I said that I wasn't going to cook the vegetables anymore. And I said we're going to cut back on the red meat for a while. Where in the world did you get this idea? I've been reading some of the articles that are posted on rawdoctors.com and they make a lot of sense. You've got aches and pains, I got high blood pressure, and it's time that we did something about our health. So, this is what I'm going to do. Come on, do it just for a little while, sweetie. To learn what Susan has learned and more, visit rawdoctors.com. And now, back to Grassy Roots on Channel 6 TV with Beth Overhow and Jim Carrey. So, here we are in the kitchen again. Mm -hmm. And you're going to make something I've never made as a meat eater, much less a vegetarian or any other way. I'm sure you've had sauerkraut before. Not on, by choice. It's not something I've learned to eat. You're wearing different shoes today, Today, by the way. I am. You're, you're much shorter. <laughs> Usually we're like this. <laughs> um, yeah, we're making veggie kraut, actually, a form of sauerkraut, a popular German dish. It's a lightly fermented food, which is really good for a number of factors in the body, the di digestional tract, the RH factor. So really good stuff, and it's really simple, uh -huh. okay? Um, that's why I say being eating raw and eating organic does not have to be expensive, because if we do these things ourselves, they're quick, they're easy. And what I'm gonna do, I've got a whole head of cabbage here, and once again, I couldn't find organic, so I took what I could find. And obviously, if I had a bigger, better, sharper knife, this would be easier. <laughs> We accept presents and donations. Yeah. <laughs> we need to bring something from the farm up here next trip. But all I'm doing is chopping this up into chunks. Now, it is, it is fun to do it in the food processor sometimes. 
especially if you got one of those nice big food processors. Right. But the point here is that you don't want to, uh, uh, we're going to chop this some more, but you don't want to chop it up too small. Oh. Okay. Um, you really don't need to. Now, what I've got here is a German kraut pot. Okay. Okay. This is a Gartoff brand, uh, seven and a half liters. It was what I could find when I bought it on eBay. Oh. Okay. Even used on eBay, they're one hundred and fifty dollars. Whoa! Now you can do this with a kitchen pot. Okay. Okay. The trick of the kitchen pot is you want to find a plate that fits right inside and almost fills it. Okay. And then and then the other things we'll do. I'll talk about the kitchen pot some more. Okay. But this is really the way to do it. It's got the ceramic lid. And we're going to make a vapor barrier here by filling this rim with water. Oh. I'm just going to set this aside. Okay. And you need to keep pressure on your kraut. That's why the plate, when I say you got to put a plate inside of the pot. Okay. And then you got to put a big old rock on top of it. Well, this has these two ceramic things. Uh -huh. Obviously, you run them through the dishwasher, get them good right. and clean. One tip about these pots. Don't storm with the lid on. They will mildew on you. Oh, we don't want that. Yeah, and then no. you got this Ugh. sticky pot. Now, they have a rough bottom. You notice I brought a plastic mat with this so I didn't tear your counter up. Okay? Oh, and this yeah. rough ceramic bottom will scratch the countertop. So you just take your pot here, and all we need to do is chunk this a little smaller. And by the way, you can add anything you want into your kraut to make it the way you want it. Mm -hmm. In other words, a common thing is to use red cabbage instead of instead of the greens, mm -hmm. and you get a nice red a red veggie kraut. And see, chunks like this are fine. Carrots, okay. peppers. Carrots, peppers. Um, actually, I, I've got a bunch of the things here. I'm gonna throw a little sesame seed in as I get higher up on there, and. Um, you do it in layers then, or does it matter? Yeah, layers is the way to do, right? Okay. And another thing I like to put in it, a lot of this is going to mash up when we go at it with our club. <laughs> You'll see it in a minute. You'll see it in a minute. So this like this, this is fine. Just open it up some. Don't have to make it real small. And really, when I'm doing this on the farm, yeah. It's like five minutes to chop up the, uh, yeah, yeah, two can play. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. It's five minutes to chop this up. People talk about, oh, raw food takes so much time. Raw vegan takes, I mean, raw, uh, what's that word we want? Um, gourmet. Gourmet. Gourmet takes a lot of time. But the basic raw diet is, is quicker than doing, it's just as quick as doing microwave food, I swear. Uh -huh. um, by the time you get it out, I'm going to throw a little sesame in as I'm going. Okay. Okay. And uh, you just keep opening these up. Then you don't have to break them up that much because it's, it's all about juicing this. There's something whole and earthy about this. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> There's something personal about making your own food. And, you know, we talk about... Uh, the biophotonic energies of food. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a certain energy we impart to our foods when we make it ourselves. You know, it's like grandma's homemade pies. I think one of the things that make them so good is the love she put into it. Mm -hmm. That's why even when somebody says to me, oh, Brother Jim, try my fried chicken. And I don't say things like, oh, I don't eat that stuff. No, the approach there is, you know, Sister Bessie, I really appreciate that you made that for me. Yeah, and I really appreciate all the love you work you put in, you put into it. But, you know, my doctor wouldn't like that if I ate that. You want to put a little more? Yep, you yep. Good idea. Anything else besides oh, I'm gonna put some sunflower seed in. Another thing to put in for flavor and color is beets. I think I think you said when I called that you had beets in the refrigerator? Well, I thought, we, well, we do, yeah, we, we do. Yeah, we, we'll get that beet out, we can cut it up in it. Yeah. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> um, I, I, they don't last as long as I thought they did <laughs> in the refrigerator, so we might leave this out this time. Uh, let's not put that beet in my kraut, no. <laughs> you can just, ew, ew, just get out of here. <laughs> Go sterilize your hands, that's gross. Okay. <laughs> Um, 
Well, you know, Beth, that's, that's part of what we were saying uh, the other week on the show about, um, you know, we tend to throw away 25 to 50 percent of our produce. Mm -hmm. And when I say that being raw vegan is not, is not expensive, it's because I'm going to the market a couple times a week. But how long does it take to fly down the produce aisle and go through the self-checkout? Not very long. No, I'm in and out in less time than mom used to take shopping weekly for the family. Because it's produce aisle and maybe to swing, aside, swing around to the spice aisle or uh -huh. something like that. But once you know the layout of your market, you're in and out. You're in the quickie checkout. If not 20 items or less than the self-serve. But not throwing stuff away. Uh, we had that the other day where uh, uh, I went in the studio fridge mm -hmm. and you said, we're out of food. And I said, no, it's just about making recipes for what we've got because the only thing we really needed was some romaine lettuce. Yeah. And other than that, we had plenty of food. Yeah. That going out and shopping again is why we end up throwing stuff away. Um, we're going to cover this more in other ep rep uh, episodes. Now, the, you, you, need a, you, you need you need. <laughs> You need to beat this into submission, okay, to get the juices flowing. Okay. Okay, and I like a baseball bat. You just scrub your baseball bat up. But if you don't tell the cooking show, I'm going to tear their rolling pin apart. <laughs> because, you know, I really believe in reuse and recycle and finding other uses. Just... We'll do a time lapse on this because I am going to beat on this for about five minutes. And it's probably making the camera shake over there. It could well do that. Okay. But all I'm doing here is mashing this down. And what I'm trying to do is get the juices flowing. Because the obvious question here that you haven't asked yet <laughs> is how much vinegar are you going to put yeah, in your I was, crab? I was wondering what the juice was going to be. The juice is going to come from the cabbage itself. Huh. No vinegar. Huh. Now, vinegar is really not part of Dr. Ann's program at all. It's got digestive issues. Um, it's got body chemistry issues. So, uh, and I made that mistake myself in my early veggie trouts. trouts. Yeah, good. I think this is a good way to get rid of displaced aggression. Yeah, and I made that mistake on my early veggie crops was uh, throwing some vinegar in there, thinking I needed that to get it started. Right. There's a reason it's not in the recipes. It's not in the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's throw some sesame down in there. Now you got it knocked down. Okay. And, go ahead, pound away. Okay. Oh, I should not have asked. Should I have? <laughs> it's kind of like. And I, I, I missed this in my layers. This is my oh. favorite thing is dulse flakes. It's a dried form of seaweed. Uh -huh. And it gives it a salty flavor. Hang on just a minute. Okay. What I'm going to do is reach down in here. And stir it up a bit. And stir it down under. I like the seaweed flavor. I like sushi, so I like yeah. seaweed flavor. Yeah, let's throw some more dulse soon. That's my favorite flavoring. So lots of dulse. Get your hands right down in this. Now uh, the stick will pound it down in. You don't have to worry about arranging it. It's already smelling interesting. Mm-hmm. Now can you put onions? And, you know, if you want an onion -y? You, you, you know, you can put anything in this you want. Wow. Onions aren't highly recommended. All right. Minimum of onions for raw fooders. Again, okay. that's not part of Dr. Ann's program. But I don't think it's onion. I don't think it's pizza without onion like we did the other week. Um, garlic. Garlic is good for you, though. So instead of onion, as a pure raw living fooder, uh -huh. it's garlic instead of onion. Now, how long do you do this? I mean, five minutes, yes, but what's, what, what are you looking for? You're, you're, you're looking for it to, to, to start being juicy and well mashed. And it's actually getting a little juicy now, but... My criteria is, is I, I pound on it until my arms get tired. You, you go for it. And then, that <laughs> takes, and then that takes off a part of my having to go outside and work, work on the farm, you know, my... My two hours a day outdoors doing something, well, this counts. Uh, oh, yeah. This is and upper particularly body if you, workout. If you change left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wax on, wax off. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> thump on, thump off. And you see where, see it's a little close to the edge here? Yeah. You see where a baseball, baseball bat, bat just works. Okay, just scrub it up good. Yeah, because you could hurt your knuckle if you're not careful. Yeah. Yeah, and baseball bat, you go boom, and you're getting both hands on it. You're really mashing. 
Is it uh, very likely you'd break this, the, the crock pot? I've had this for five years and I've used a baseball bat on it repeatedly. <laughs> 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 but I have, in particular what I've seen is people drop the lid and the lids break. Yeah, um, it is heavy. Yeah, it's about 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, Now, do you typically want to fill it to the top and then start mashing it, or does it matter? No, you as a matter of fact, if I was really making a full recipe, uh -huh. and primarily I mentioned this is seven and a half liters, and you don't need one this big. Uh, that was just what I was able to find. Uh, um, yeah, I couldn't even... I mean, fi just finding them on the Internet is a challenge. Um, you see, all those spices are mixed in real mm. good. I just want to taste it. Yeah. Before, mm -hmm. before taste and after taste. That's a good idea. That was a nice cabbage. Cabbage has a kind of sweetness to it. Mm hmm Yeah, I use it sparingly in salads, but most of my cabbage ends up in the crock pot. See, that's really mashed up well there. I'm mm -hmm. even hitting the bottom of the pot from time to time. Mm hmm So, all we want to do from here is get it nice and level. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's get this right in the camera so you don't miss it. I take my waiting stones here. Okay. And they fit They fit right in side by side so they cover the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I'm not pounding on them. You're pushing. I'm I just want to seat them down there firmly. Mm -hmm. and I mean, this is so complex. It's so high tech. <laughs> We're almost done. I clean out the edge because this is going to sit for at least three days, maybe a week. It depends on the temperature in the room. Mm -hmm. Put the lid on and take, I use filtered water for everything. And what this does is make a vapor seal. Okay. So that fermentation expands, right? Right. So what you'll hear from time to time is you hear blurp, 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 blurp. And this sits on the kitchen, it sits on the kitchen counter. And you can check it from time to time. Just then you have gently to add take more water. off. Oh, the water doesn't go down in there. Yeah. Does, water doesn't go down in. And you can go in, but three to five days, when it really starts bubbling a lot, now you watch, I sit this down gently. It'll let the air out. Huh. And uh, never more than a week. Well. But uh, when it's really bubbling good, it's ready. And then it's bring it, and bring it out, ladle it up. Veggie crot like this will keep for a month in the fridge. So it's a good standby yeah. when you we don't have yeah. much time to prepare food. Oh, you know what I did in the last batch? I like because they're in season. Cranberries. Mm -hmm. ah. I did cranberry veggie crop. Ooh. It's just imagination. It's, it's like there's no there's no chemical reaction going on here. Therefore, you can add anything you like the taste of. And when you mess up a recipe, you just thin it out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I told you about my clove soup. <laughs> <laughs> And that's right. it, Beth. Well, you have veggie okay. trout, and we'll harvest that next week. And delayed gratification. I have to wait. <laughs> With a few things in ruffles. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. We do not make any more sauerkraut because it takes pounding and it takes seven days. This particular method, for several reasons, it takes only three days. Plus, we use the underground vegetables such as beets, cauliflower, and cabbage. Those beets, I mean, uh, um, carrots are very, very good because they do all those, like, beets and carrots make color. So what we do, we grind it. We put it in the grinder and we proceed with grinding it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Two beets, plenty. Carrots, yes, a lot of carrots. But not so much of the beets, because it just take home. It's part of the color. So I'll put some beets later. Now, if you decided to put celery, it is better to cut up your celery rather than put it through the uh, champion. So now what we will do, we'll mix it all together. We do not use any seasoning. We don't need to. And all we'll do is put it into the crock. So that will take three days. Sometimes two, and other times maybe four, because it depends on the weather. And of course, um, we want to put a cabbage leaves on top, and then now uh, we'll take a jar of water, jar of water, any, any jar will do. This, this jar is, is fine. Fill it with water and put it on top of the uh, cabbage leaves. Because the, the water will weigh it down. That's the reason we use the, the jars, because it weighs down the uh, particular uh, vegetables, and that means that will uh, ferment that. It just fermenting for fermenting for then the juice comes up the top and generally what we do we just take the uh, the leaf and remove it through the compost and that's all there is and you're ready to use it two three or four days and then you can put it into a jar and ready for use. And this is the ready veg crop. So you have a veg crop. It's ready for use. So that's all. Let's do it. It's so simple. And we'd never go without it because that contributes several different things to it. Because it's fermented with the enzymes, it's because it's easy to digest. And we do not have to use the vegetables like the ordinary would have to use. We use it in this fashion. And th that is, um, I have put a lot of different vegetables in there. I cut up celery. I even cut up some, some of the red pepper. We even zucchini. Looking for a comprehensive guide on the subject of the raw foods lifestyle? Susan Shang has written an encyclopedia on the subject, The Live Food Factor. This comprehensive guide to the ultimate diet for body, mind, spirit, and planet covers every possible factor related to the subject. This compilation has received rave reviews by those in the raw foods movement. Visit www.livefoodfactor.com for your copy. The Live Food Factor by Susan Shang. When truth rings, curiosity sings. Finding yourself raw curious? Dr. Ann Wigmore's Raw Living Foods Lifestyle Home Study Program has the answers. 
Check out SheDiet.com and satisfy your raw curiosity. And now, back to Grassy Roots on Channel 6 TV with Beth Overhaugh and Jim Carrey. Next on Grassy Roots, organic gardening tips from Frank Colvin of Country Greenhouse to Garden. Hi, I'm here in the country. It's beautiful. I'm with Frank Colvin, who is an area organic farmer. Hi, Frank. Hi. Ah. This is the time of year when people are starting to think about putting in a garden, maybe beginners. And right. I think that's who we're going to address. Right. There's right. people that really don't know what they're doing. But with the recession the way it is, people are maybe thinking about putting in their own garden, growing their own food. That's correct. And Frank, you've been at this for a while. Yeah, I've been at it uh, most of my life. I mean, my dad and I all raised gardens and stuff. And uh, since I retired, I just picked it up. And that's basically all I do now. And it's turned into a little home-based business for Yeah, you. just uh, small. What's small. the name of your business? Uh, country Greenhouse to Garden. And you provide from seeds to the finished product. That's right. The greenhouse comes in early in the year and we get the plants all going and move, we move several plants, not a lot, but uh, and then once the greenhouse kind of dies away, we go to the gardening aspect of it then and start doing some gardening and selling vegetables and so on and so forth. And we're standing right now in what will be your your garden. Yeah. I know she haven't tilled yet. No. It's still, oh, it's mid-March. That's right. When do people need to start breaking the ground? Well, now's a good time, uh, providing you can get the ground dry enough. Uh, this time of year, you you never know. You know, it one day it's dry, next day it's wet. But you can, al you can always go out in the garden and, and check pretty much to see whether it's uh, dry enough or some some people like to break it when it's a little damp mm -hmm. they call it slick right uh, they'll turn it over and the ground will be slick they go ahead and break it hoping for a freeze oh and the freeze will just like freeze dry it. the freeze the freeze dry it and right. break it down uh, like today it's wet uh -huh. if you was to break today then you'd almost have to have a freeze if you happen to not get a freeze then you'll just get a big bunch of uh, big balls of dirt in your garden. It's it's kind of like uh, clumpy. Clumpy, yeah. Uh, what like, do you look for? Like well, like right now, this is this is uh, pretty much as you can see. It's it's pretty wet. Yeah. You know, if you take a hold, it's not too bad though. Not too bad. No, no it, it'll crumbles. it'll it'll crumble. This would probably break. But now, if you squeeze it, and it pretty much makes a hard ball, uh -huh. and, and when you squeeze it, it don't break. And once the what we used to throw at each other is right. right. <laughs> It, it tends to stay together and not come apart. Uh -huh. Then that's what they call it being kind of slick and they don't want, they some of them will break and wait for a freeze, hope for a freeze. Of course, if you don't get the freeze, then there's what you'll get in your garden. A big clump. Mm -hmm. Big clumps, you'll have big clumps. Now this is not bad though. I don't think this would really clump up. Yeah. But it's- How uh, deep do you go? Uh, we usually break about 12 to 14 inches. 12 to 14. So how many times with the tiller does it take to go? If you're doing it with a tiller instead if you, of a Of course, tractor. now with a tiller, you can't you can't go 12 to 14 inches. You can just go the depth of your tiller. tiller. Uh, in this situation, I would break it with, with a turning plow. I've got turning plows for my tractor, and I'd break it about 12 to 14 inches. But now the ones that don't have turning plows, you could go over this. This is too wet for a tiller. Oh, okay. Just a tiller. It'll clunk around your tiller. It, it would wad up in like your tiller and make a mess. If you wait a little later till it starts drying out, uh, probably one time over it and then let it set for a day and then go back over it again it'd be ready to oh, okay it'd be ready to plant you want well, once you turn it up you want that to dry out a little bit uh -huh. you could also go over it again for the third time and it would uh, it make it it would be a little finer and if you're planting seed which is good if you're planting seed if you're planting vegetable plants it don't have to be quite as, oh, as fine okay. now as an organic gardener you do not use uh, herbicides. No. Very, How do you prevent weeds from taking coming well, to your garden? Well, now, a lot of muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was going to be work involved. <laughs> uh, out here, we, uh, I work it up real good uh -huh. and try to turn everything under, all the weeds and everything. Of course, you're going to get a lot of weed seed. Quick as the plants get set good and everything, then I start 
I start tillering. In between. In between the rows. I start tillering. And of course, we've got some gooseneck hoes here also that we use. And basically, that's how we keep the weeds down. How wide should your rows be? So you're just as wide as your tiller is or a little you bit need, wider? No, you need a little wider than your tiller. Now, you need to go about probably six, to, about at least six inches or eight inches wider than your tiller because most of your stuff, once it gets up any size, it's going to lap in on you. Oh, okay. Then you can't get through it, especially beans and tomatoes and that type of thing. I plant my tomatoes three feet apart. Oh, okay. I plant them three feet apart in every direction. You can tiller, but you can tiller up and down across, and that way you don't have to worry about the holes about so Cause much. Because it is easier to till the rows, what, every couple of weeks? Yeah, just well, go out there and hoe it. depending on the weather, and what, if you get a lot of rain, of course you get a lot of grass and a lot of weed seed. Uh -huh. if, you get, um, if it stays dry, you don't get as much. But the tiller is a whole lot easier than the gooseneck hoe. Oh yeah. You know. It, what about mulching? Mulching works good. We use all our grass clippings, all our yard clippings, in our tomatoes especially. Once, once the mowing season starts, then we start uh, hauling. We've got a what we call a power rake, pulls behind our mower, and we pick up all our clippings off the yard, and we put them in our in our tomatoes. We around uh, the tomatoes, around the tomatoes, and in the rows completely. Try to completely compost all the tomatoes that what we've got. Newspaper it. shredded paper. News that any well, good? yeah, it would work. I, I'd say it would work good. I've never tried it. A lot uh, of people that are sort of semi-city folk might have a lot of shredded paper. <laughs> if you could, if you could get it to hold in the garden, would be the big thing. Which it blows it away. Blows away. I mean, you could always pick up a, a scoop of dirt, Throw it pitch on it, it, you know, yeah, something yeah. like that. Uh, but uh, sort all of in recycle, all, recycle, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All in all, I'd say it would be. It would probably be good. Now, we've talked about herbicide. What about fertilizer? Fertilizer. As an organic gardener, what do you use for fertilizer? I use manure, mostly cow manure. Uh, we've got, uh, we keep a few cows around the farm here, and a uh, neighbor up here has got horses. Uh, can you buy manure if you need manure? Sure, you can I buy mean, I don't have any yeah. cows. <laughs> yeah, you, you can buy manure. Uh, Matter of fact, Walmart sells manure. Walmart sells manure. Walmart sells bag. It's organic manure. It's organic manure. Uh, of course, what's, comes, or, what's not organic about manure? Yeah, <laughs> I guess I, it I, depends on what the cow eats. <laughs> but uh, they sell it by the bag, by like a 25 pound bag. I don't. It would probably turn out pretty expensive if yeah. you had to buy a lot of it. Yeah. Which uh, mine comes free. Yeah. <laughs> it ain't really free. Got to feed the cows. Yeah. But uh, no, it's. Uh, I use a lot of manure. Uh, which, is, as far as I'm concerned, is some of the best fertilizer you can use. Uh, you got to be careful with it, uh, especially around young plants and mm -hmm. stuff that you don't burn them up. But once the plants, if you'll put it in early and turn it under and tiller it in good, you don't have to worry about it so much. But now if you try to use it throughout top, the season, throughout the season uh -huh. top dressing, uh -huh. then you're going to run into problems with, with heat. And the older the manure, the better the manure. The older, the older the manure, the better. The better it, it tends to break down and get a lot of the acid out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what burns most stuff is the acid in the manure. Uh, manure's got a lot of uh, nutrients in it that really helps the plants and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, if you uh, if you try top dressing with fresh manure, it's almost out of the question. You know, because it's it's got so much, it's too, much, it's too, too much, it's too hot. And the same can be true of the compost. It right. can be too hot. It can be to too hot. That's okay. correct. Well, I guess that would be a good beginning for our, our viewers. If they want to start a garden, they, they need to look at the soil to see if it's ready to be tilled. That's they right. need to know to till in the manure early enough so that if they're going organic. Um, herbicides are no-nos right. for an organic garden. And um, that's the start. That's correct. And we'll we'll talk about seeds next week. Okay. All right. Thanks. Very good. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching Channel 6 Television and Grassy Roots. Watch future episodes of Grassy Roots for more organic gardening tips with Frank Colvin. <laughs>
Want to learn more about a raw living foods lifestyle? There's a wide collection of videos on the subject at gdietvideos.com. You can find a video on any subject that suits your interest and your budget, including rare footage of Dr. Ann Wigmore's Raw Living Food Lifestyle programs. This knowledge could change your life. Check out chidietvideos.com. One of the best things terrorists could do is just build more fast food restaurants, maybe add another pharmaceutical company, have a couple more infomercials, and encourage people to eat the way they eat now. And everybody's going to be dead in 100 years. They can just walk right in, don't have to do a thing. One quarter of what you eat keeps you alive, and three quarters of what you eat keeps your doctor alive. I used to get high for a living, eating on the bullshit food that is all me. Cancer rates going up, heart disease going up, stroke going up. We're poisoning ourselves with highly processed, nutrient depleted foods. One of the major problems is what we do to the soil and the air and the water and everything we take in our food. We, for whatever reason, decided we're going to spray everything with every kind of pesticide, herbicide, larvicide, fungicide. We decided we're going to genetically modify things we don't know anything about. Can we actually improve what has already been created? And the answer is maybe, but not the way we've been doing it. If you want to know what's wrong, look down at the table. It's staring back at you. Think of it as chronic malnutrition, because that's what's going on. But if we think we're going to go to the doctor and get a pill for everything, we've missed the whole point. We have been taught our whole lives to be consumers of modern medicine, which is pharmaceutical medicine. Good health makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make a lot of dollars. Now, the drug industry has every right to make money, no question about that at all. The ethics, I think, need to be very closely watched. What the pharmaceutical companies are doing may not necessarily be in the interest of our population. You can be as sincere, and you can be sincerely wrong. Approximately 106,000 Americans die from pharmaceutical drugs each year. And these are people who took the medication as directed. There is a lot more turning to alternatives because what's being done before you doesn't work. There is no magic bullet, but there is a lifestyle change that reverses serious chronic disease. It's cheap, it's simple, it's safe, it's effective. The solutions are here. They've always been here. Every single person in the world, every culture, every language, every person in the world knows it. You are what you eat. Food does matter. It's a choice. You don't have to be sick. For a full-length DVD copy of Food Matters, go to grassyroots.com slash food. When truth rings, curiosity sings. Finding yourself raw curious? Dr. Ann Wigmore's Raw Living Foods Lifestyle Home Study Program has the answers. Check out SheDiet.com and satisfy your raw curiosity. When it comes to obesity, it's not about how much you eat, it's what you eat. Learn more with Beth Overhout as she chats with Dr. Jim Carrey on Grassy Roots TV, airing Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock on Channel 6 Television. Getting back to the roots of healthy eating.